Hello students of Dynamics, this is Dr. Dan Baker with an example problem focused on rigid body impulse and momentum. Once again, this is a kinetics topic talking about relating motion and forces. And this is a simplified example that we just have one single body to worry about. And so that will make our computations a little bit easier than if you had multiple bodies. We need to add together all the impulse and all the momentum from the various bodies. All right, so the problem sketch, we have a spool. Now the reason I call this a spool and not a, uh, a thin disc, you'll see is that there's actually two different radiuses, kind of an inner and an outer. It turns out that the inner radius here is a value of 0 0.4 meters, and then out to the outside edge is 0 0.75 meters. And this spool is being pulled by a cable you could think wrapped around the inter portion here. So it's P. And so the problem statement tells us that we have a 100 kilogram spool which has a radius of gyration. Right? Remember, radius of gyration is K, and this is going to be about the centroid, so either call that K sub G or K bar, equal to 0 0.35 meters. So let me just pull a note here. This is the radius of gyration. And hopefully remember that given the mass and given the radius of gyration gives us enough information to compute the mass moment of inertia about, in this case, the centroid, and this system is going to start at rest. Before being pulled. For five seconds. by a P is equal to T plus 10 Newton force, where this T is going to be time in seconds. And our question is, what is the final angular velocity. Which we could write as a mega two. All right, so what is the final angular velocity of this system? All right, so this is a kinetics problem. Let's start out with a free body diagram. So our free body diagram, here's our spool. We have given this time variable P force we also have the weight. I could write that as W or even mass times gravity. We're also going to have a normal force pushing back up from the surface. Now, we also are going to need a friction force. If we didn't have a friction force, fundamentally, this thing would spin in place. Um, but if we have a friction force, it's going to roll along that surface. Okay, now you'll notice in this problem, it didn't frame any information about the friction force. It actually turns out that whether it spun in place or whether it moved along the surface, I'm pretty sure it would have the same omega. I have to compute it the other way as well. But um, given the context that we weren't asked about the friction force, that we weren't given any kind of information about the friction or the friction coefficient, the maximum, you can kind of think that we probably are going to focus our analysis about this inst instantaneous center, this contact point, because then we can ignore the friction, ignore the normal in our, at least our sum of our moments equation. And so that's kind of the direction that we'll go. So, so far I've covered now in this drawing our free body diagram terms. Let's add in our kinetic terms as well. So kinetically, if it sticks here at the IC, we're going to end up with an omega that's negative from the right-hand rule and a velocity of the centroid. Let me go ahead and write that as mv bar, which is going to be horizontal. Now, once again, the reason I'm focusing on kinetic terms, which are velocities, is that impulse momentum is a kinetic-based framework as opposed to 
Newtonian kinetics, which is an acceleration-based framework. Okay, so this is my free body diagram plus my kinetic. All right, so looking first at our linear impulse momentum. And I'm going to start with my linear impulse momentum in the y direction. Now, anytime that you write, hey, this is going to be sum of forces in the y, linear impulse momentum in the y, my brain always defaults to say, well, have I drawn an axis system? Axis systems are required so that we know exactly what direction things are going in. And so in the y direction, we're going to look at that equation. So the general equation for linear impulse momentum in the y is going to be mv1 bar, we'll put the sub y plus the integral of the sum of our forces in the y direction dt is equal to mv2 of the centroid sub y. Now I didn't write these as vectors because I've already isolated everything into the y direction. And so there's really no need at this point. We know everything's gonna be in the y. Now we started at rest. So therefore this first term will go to zero. And then also because all of our motion is horizontal, it turns out that our final velocity in the y is also zero. We do have some velocity in the x, but not in the y. And so what we're left here with this equation that says the sum of our forces dt is equal to zero. So writing these out, we have our normal force, which is applied over a time interval of five seconds. And then we have our weight force, which is going to be our mass times gravity, also times five seconds. Now, once again, the reason these five seconds are being added is that these forces are both constant and they're constant over the five seconds. So I just need to multiply the constant force times the time. And this is equal to zero. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting about this equation is that I can divide um, all these terms by five seconds. Of course, dividing zero by five seconds still gives me zero. So the time doesn't really matter in this equation. And it really becomes effectively the same equation as sum of forces equal to zero, just like we had in statics. But we find out that N is equal to mass times gravity. So it's going to be that 100 kilograms times my 9.81 meters per second squared. So now to get into my angular impulse momentum equation. So there was our linear. Now looking at our angular. Now here's that choice we have about where we sum our moments about. Now you could do the centroid that would bring in your friction force as an unknown variable. So far it hasn't showed up yet, so let's keep it that way. So we're gonna have our angular impulse momentum about our IC, our instant center of zero velocity. Now because we were given our mass moment of inertia as related to the rate of gyration about the centroid, right? Keep in mind that information was given here about the centroid G. There's really no direct and easy way to shift that down to your IC. It's possible, but let's just go ahead and sum our moment, add in our momentum moment so we can see how that works and go from there. All right, so our generalized equation, I bar, omega one as a vector plus my momentum moment. This is going to be R of G relative to my IC as I cross that with my mass times my velocity one bar vector. I add to that my angular impulse, the integral of the sum of my moments about the IC point dt, and this is going to be equal to the final momentum, which is my I bar omega two vector plus my momentum moment r of g relative to my ic as a vector crossed into m v2 bar vector all right so getting rid of the things that go to zero we have no motion initially it's at rest which means both the omega and also the linear velocity go to zero so the whole first term goes to zero we're basically left with impulse is equal to final momentum since it didn't start with any initial momentum so um, my sum of moments i have actually only one force if we take a look here 
I'll go in purple for an R vector, right? From my instantaneous center, where I'm summing moments about, I can stretch up here an R vector up to my P force, which is horizontal. That'll be negative from the right-hand rule. There'll be no moment from our weight force, no moment from the normal, no moment from the friction force, because all those lines of action go through the IC point. Now, keep in mind that that force P was time variable. So I'll have to write that out. Negative from the right-hand rule integral from 0 to 5 seconds. The P force is T plus 10. So just reminding ourselves that's P. And then the distance is going to be the distance up to the center from the bottom. So 0 0.75 meters plus an additional distance from G up to the line of action of P. So 0 0.4 meters to get up there, that whole thing dt. Now you could factor out your distance because it's constant. You get the same overall value. You can compute that however you'd like to. And then this is going to be equal to my moment of inertia. I know that I bar is equal to m k sub g squared and it's going to be that term times my final omega 2. Now this omega 2 noting that we've assumed it is negative from the right hand rule, right? So this is negative from the right hand rule. So therefore I need to write this as a negative omega 2. And then I add in my cross product term, which also is going to be negative. Negative because I'm looking at about my IC coming up and looking at this brown vector here, MV bar. My R cross into that momentum is horizontal. The distance there is going to be 0 0.75. So this turns out to be 0 0.75 times 100 times my unknown V2 bar. Now I know the mass, let me go ahead and substitute these in. So I know this mass here is 100. I know that I was given my K bar, I'll put that down here, is 0 0.35 squared. Just looking at knowns and unknowns. The T will go away on the left-hand side as I integrate. And so I'm really left with kind of these two unknowns, omega 2 and V bar. But once again, because I, I know about instantaneous centers of zero velocity, I can find that my velocity of my centroid is equal to 0 0.75, the distance from the IC up to your centroid, times omega 2, the angular velocity of that body. So now I have everything in terms of omega 2. With that information, I can then solve that omega 2 is equal to positive 1.05 radians per second. Now, the positive 1.05 comes from the fact I assumed right here that my omega was negative. Okay, so uh, I'm going to list this out if you want to list it as a vector in the negative k hat. And I'll say as a positive value from our algebra proved our negative k hat assumption correct. And of course, if you had put in a positive omega-2 here at this location, you'd need to have your V-bar going to the left to correspond with that positive omega. So this gets into that nuance of making sure that your linear and your angular velocities, specifically when they're unknown, right? And so if you know one, match the other one to that direction. But if you don't know either one, make sure they're going in the same general direction. And so that would be our answer there for omega 2. And given that I added on the direction, let's go ahead and call that omega 2 as a vector. So in this example, we had a single rigid body 
we know that we needed a free body diagram simply because we're relating motion to forces. So we had both a free body diagram as well as a kinetic diagram. Now, showing you this linear impulse momentum in the y direction, this first step here, really the purpose there was more to show what happens if you don't have a change in momentum in that direction it turned out we didn't need this equation to solve the problem now you could use that equation if you want to to solve for n you could also do your linear, linear impulse momentum in the x direction and solve for f you could add those steps in but really the only step that we needed to solve this problem was to look at our angular impulse momentum about our instantaneous center of zero velocity, the contact point with the horizontal surface. We had no initial angular momentum. We had a time variable impulse, so we took an integral. And then on the right-hand side, we paid attention to the signs of our vector terms and related those to our free body diagram and our kinetic diagram using the right-hand rule. So I hope that this example was valuable walking through these multiple steps and hope you're having an awesome day.